Aunque igual no sé, como que para mí que fue. Igual no Hello, everyone. Thank you to everyone who is joining us on Zoom right now. Uh, we're just going to get started at about 7.05 here. So get settled, grab a drink, and we'll be getting going in the next three or four minutes here. Thank you for your patience. For those of you who are joining us online, Thank you so much for being here this evening. We'll get going in about three minutes. Um, so yeah, if you wanna grab a beverage, uh, you have a few minutes before we get started and we're really looking forward to, to this evening's program. So we'll get started at about 7.05 uh, Mountain Time. Hello to everyone who is joining us online. Just wanted to let you know that we'll be getting started at about 7.05 here. So please make yourselves comfortable. Thank you again for joining uh, Indigenous Rights, Knowledge and Tailings. And we'll be, be beginning shortly. And shortly. Hello, folks. Thanks so much for joining us online. Just to let you know, we'll be getting started in about a minute here. So if you want to grab yourself a drink and settle in, thank you for joining us for Indigenous knowledge, or sorry, Indigenous rights, knowledge, and healings. We're really looking forward to this evening's event, and we'll be getting started very shortly. Ready to rock. <laughs> so welcome everybody. Good evening. Um, nice to see you all here and good evening to everyone online. Uh, Jesse Carnell, Netsiga Soon, Kikno Tsenia, um, Keepers at Toskian, uh, Kita Tomskat Nawao. I'm Jesse Cardinal. I'm from the community of Kikino Metis Settlement in Treaty 6 Territory. Woo, woo. Um, and I work for Keepers of the Water. I'm currently serving as the executive director. And I welcome you all. Um, so I'm sure you guys are all as excited as I am for this evening. I'm looking forward to listening to all the speakers. Mike Mercury, who I haven't seen in a long time and just doing amazing work. Cleo Reese, who's one of the co-chairs for Keepers of the Water, and she's, uh, they're all amazing. Jean Lomcourt and Daniel Teselli, so we'll be hearing from them all. Um, I think I did housekeeping with everybody. For those of you online, sorry, we can't serve you guys drinks and, you know, water and coffee, so help yourselves at home. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to do an overview. I'll, I'll work really hard to stick to the agenda tonight. Um, <clears throat> an overview of the first symposium. So this is the second of three symposiums we're doing. The first one that we did was on science. And so the whole purpose of these symposiums is to look at what the current proposal is by the Alberta government and the industries up in the tar sands 
And that proposal, they want to start dumping the tailings ponds into the Athabasca River. And so that's we that's like uh, when Keepers of the Water found out, uh, I'm, an, I'm with Keepers of the Water, we were just like uh, in shock. We were in shock that they would even consider something like this. And so we mobilized really quickly to learn about you know, what does this even mean? What does this look like? And so we had science people come and look at the science that was being provided by the industry and the governments and very quickly found out that it's still not going to be safe. So even after they say they can treat it and it looks like water, that there's something called nathanic acid, which is cancer causing high levels of saline. And then what we learned, I think it was two weeks ago in our science panel was all of the heavy metals we need that that they may even be more harmful than the, than the nathanic acid and the saline and that there's been no independent science studies done to even prove what they say they're doing is actually what what they're doing so um we're trying to stop this from happening keepers of the water has a hard stance we are against any dumping of the tailings ponds into the athabasca river we were um uh it was came to our attention last week by Mandy Allsgard I'll say last week but I think it was like 2 weeks ago that they are doing some dumping um and so we need to learn more about that cuz there shouldn't be any dumping and so that was the first session you guys can see that online it's on keepers of the water website council of canadians website both of our facebook pages it's super informative like i was just um so uh enlightened I don't know if that's the right word to use but I just learned so much from that session so if you guys haven't had a chance to watch it I would say watch it um <clears throat> so now we're here today to talk about indiz indigenous knowledge but <clears throat> um I was always told if you're gonna be like an MC or do public speaking you should tell some jokes or something and I'm not like, I'm not a funny person and um but I thought of some jokes <laughs> along the way so it's Halloween. Halloween is coming up. So I wanted to tell like kind of like a, <clears throat> what do you call it? A scary story or something. You guys aren't going to get this joke. It's like a bad joke, but I'm going to try my best. So <laughs> um, so it's kind of like, you know, when somebody says boo and you're like, ooh, scary, like boo. Um, so I'm going to say two boos. Um, and so if you're in a room with like government people or a full room of non-indigenous people this these words might scare you co-management <laughs> land back <laughs> i told you they were really bad so anyway let's get on with the program <laughs> let's get on with the program so i'm going to ask wendy who's um she's a she's the new uh uh, she's new with Council of Canadians, but she's not new to the work. She's from uh, Saskatchewan, which I think is Treaty 4 territory. She's Indigenous. And uh, so we're so happy to have her and be working with her. So I'm going to pass it over to Wendy. So we're trying this, this hybrid stuff because a lot of people are online and then we have people here. So we'll be switching back and forth from myself um, and to Wendy. So I'm going to pass it over to Wendy now. Well, thank you. Oh my gosh, it's such a wonderful greeting from everyone. And I'm so looking forward to working with all of you tonight. It's just, it's such a, a, an important time for all of us and in, in the work that we do. And I know that uh, Jesse, you have been really involved and in everyone that I'm meeting over at the council has been so reassuring in terms of we're on the same page and we're trying to work to, to get this thing back on track. So I'm very thankful to be part of of all this work. And, and you know, I, I before I begin, I really wanted us to make sure that we're grounding ourselves because um, before any of us walked this land, before I was birthed, um, my ancestors, the ancestors of my Métis background and my Soto and um, my, my Cree, um, you know, if we go back far enough uh, in Treaty 6, uh, here in Treaty 4, we can still say we, that when I did some de curriculum development with my sister for, for the, the, the Siksika people, and they said, if you go back far enough, this this was this was the traditional territory of, of the Blackfoot people. So, you know, I want to make sure we acknowledge the, the Nakota, uh, the Sioux. Uh, there's there's such a, a history of gathering and 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 meeting and and treaty relationships and finding 
spaces where we could share and, and grow together and come together. And that was, wasn't all peaceful, but we managed to do it in ways that where we work towards a, a peaceful re resolution. And I think that it's important for us to acknowledge where we've come from, because whether or not you have Indigenous blood in, running through your veins or not, this is your history. And this is the history of this land is, is, is you. It's not just me. It's not just those who, who live in the bush and who've lived here. And, who, you know, it's, it's, it's a, our history. And so I wanted to make sure I acknowledge the land, not only of the people that have grown and walked and, and traveled and, and lived in Treaty 4, where I am here right now, I want to make sure I acknowledge the, the peoples in Treaty 6, uh, because they've all roamed in this following the herds before they were destroyed. And, and of course, uh, Treaty 8, which is the land of the Dene as well, which we're going to be specifically speaking to tonight, and their destruction that they've uh, encountered. And, and I do believe that they were also very well in Treaty 6 as well. So we have to acknowledge that the, this land, we, we inherited from the people who came before us. So I want to make sure I acknowledge that in a good way. Uh, so now I want to make sure that we start as well to, to um, invite an elder. So I'm asking Jamie Edwards to come forward. I know that she has a, a close relationship with the elder. We've asked Betty uh, Latondre to come forward and to offer us some good words and a blessing for the evening that we're going to start with this evening, because it's important. We are talking about water, which is very sacred, especially to us women. Uh, that is our responsibility. And it's a responsibility of all, all of us. Uh, but it, it's something specifically that I want to make sure that we uh, draw attention to, to tonight. So please, uh, Jenny, come on forward and thank you all for participating tonight. And I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from everyone. Thanks so much, uh, Wendy. My name is Jenny Edwards. I'm a member of the Council of Canadians and Betty, Elder Betty Latondra, it's my great honor and and privilege to welcome you tonight and to thank you for offering the prayers for, for the good outcome of this symposium and the work that we're doing. Um, as grandmothers, I know that we share a deep commitment to protecting water. And um, I would just like to offer uh, the gifts of tobacco and cloth and uh, thank you in deep gratitude for coming tonight. How the dumbscot now an honor to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you for asking and making protocol to myself with this tobacco and the cloth. I've earned all this through many years of ceremony 
many years of sacrificing myself to be able to stand not only in front of you, but in front of our creator and the ancestors that left us so much because we are very pitiful as human beings. What was left to us? We misused. And if we don't change that, we will. What we do to the earth and all that's living, that includes everything on this earth, we do to ourselves. We will also perish with what we're doing if we don't stop and have a really good look at what was left to us to borrow. It's not ours, it never was, and it never will be. So with that, people say, oh, do a blessing, do a prayer. But I believe I speak when I pray and I speak as you would know it, I speak to the creator. Not that he would only listen to me that way, but all of us together, when we ask to be honored, to, give in, to be given more guidance, to help us as we struggle from day to day, when we wake up and we say, thank you, I'm grateful for my life today. That is such a, a reward to us when we acknowledge that. And we talk about Nipi, Nipi, that water, that water has life, it has a spirit. We all come from water. Our bodies are 90% water. And without that, we will die and perish with all all our children that we love so much, our grandchildren, our chapons, our people everywhere, not just here. I ask our loving creator <clears throat> one more time to hear my plea for those special blessings tonight and always, and that we continue to always look beyond ourselves and help, help those who are less fortunate than we are. There's some people that can't see, they can't walk, they're in hospitals, they're suffering, our children, all those in our families, that they be given that special blessing, just like us. Because when one of us is blessed, so is all the rest of us will be part of that blessing. So I ask our loving creator, I say loving creator to me, and along with all my ancestors who had given me the right to live this life the way that I'm living it today and to always be grateful for every little thing that I'm given, that gift of life every day. We never know creator when you will call one of us back home and then we leave others but it's those others that we leave that we must, they must continue to do the work of our gakkyo, our kete, our elders, we say. Those old ones that fought so hard to have what we have today. And with, with that, I say, I thank you all for listening to me. And the prayer doesn't just stop here tonight. I tell everybody who in my my long list of people that I have, friends, who always who are always on this journey of prayer, as you know it. So with that, with that I say, I always uh, thank you so much to the elders. Whenever I hear the elders talk, they always will remind us of the people that are forgotten. And Betty just 
she did it again, you know, thinking about the people like the, the, the people at home, the people that, you know, are in wheelchairs are in hospitals and jails, the children in care. And so I just so thankful that the elders keep us mindful that there's more out there than just us and that we have so much to be thankful and to be grateful for. So thank you for that. Um, so moving along in our agenda, uh, I'll do a quick intro of Keepers of the Water. Um, so I'm currently serving as the Executive Director of Keepers of the Water. It's an organization that was formed in 2006. And it was formed out of a necessity to protect water. So in 2006, what was happening, and sorry for those of you who've heard this before, but there's people who haven't, is that, <laughs> is that um, there was a lot of industrial activity happening. They were in what was called a boom. So there was all kinds of oil and gas extraction, coal extraction, logging, you know, removal of wetlands, all of this stuff. And it was having impacts on the water. <clears throat> the major rivers, the water quality. So the Athabasca River, which runs into the Decho, which runs into the Arctic Ocean, this major river, which in the Dene, it's called the Mighty River or the Big River, it, the water levels were dropping so low that the people were seeing that that there was changes happening. We were seeing these changes in our community. So not only were they noticing the differences in the quality of the water, they were also uh, the quantity of the water, but also the quality of the water. And as Betty, Betty said, everything depends on water, the animals, the fish, the medicines, the berries, everything. And so the people were noticing, we were noticing the changes, uh, you know, in, in the food that we were eating and, and all of these things. And so in 2006, the Dene people got together and along with non-Indigenous people, they gathered on the shores of the Decho and they came together to say, water is sacred and we must work to protect it. And that has guided us in our work up until today. And I was having a talk with somebody yesterday <clears throat> because I was a water keeper myself. And that's how I came to be with water, uh, the keepers of the water. And I said, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's become a spiritual journey. And I didn't even and, and, and it deepens the more because I talk about water all the time. And I learned from so many elders. And but and but I realized that it, it was a spiritual journey. That's how it started out that way. And I tell people now, because I'm starting to understand the more I talk about water, my connection to water becomes stronger is we are water beings, every single one of us. So, you know, when we talk about the fish, we're like the fish. We are a water being. We are made up mostly of water. So in the English language, they call us human beings, but really we're water beings. And then to go even deeper than that, everything is a water being. Everything is made up mostly of water. And just how profound that is. Um, and so we do all kinds of things as an organization. We partnered with Council of Canadians on these three series. We had the science one. We have the Indigenous knowledge one this evening. And then we have one third one. So you guys come back for that. And that's the where do we go from here? Because we're in these climate crisis. And, and people also told me, don't say climate change anymore. It's a climate crisis. We need the people to understand how dire this situation situation is that we're in. Um, and so I just want to quickly tell you guys some of the work that Keepers of the Water is doing. So we have a tailings tar sands campaign. We are working to stop the tailings from being dumped into the Athabasca River. We, we've mobilized, we're working with so many organizations, First Nations, Métis, um, you know, all kinds of people who are just mortified or terrified that this is even happening. Another thing that we're doing, we have a coal campaign. So there's a company called uh, Vista Coal Mine. Um, the, 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 the project is called Coal Spur. The company is called Vista. And they have applied. So you know how the world's trying to phase out thermal coal because it's one of the dirtiest forms of energy on the planet. Well, this company is trying to expand thermal coal. 
And if this, and this is in Hinton area, this is like not far from here. And if this is approved, it will be one of the largest thermal coal mines in Canadian history. So while countries around the world are trying to phase out thermal coal, here is this company trying to like expand thermal coal. So we've partnered up with EcoJustice on that. And we're trying to, again, stop that from happening. And that comes, that ties back into water. There is a community not far from this coal mine they they're not on running water they still go out like a whole community the whole community has no running water they go and get their water from the stream and that's how like it seems like it's like oh my god but that's how it should be that's how removed we have all become from our water is that it's normal to have treated water but our standard for keepers of the water is what is clean water? Clean water is when you can go to the stream, when you can go to the lake and get your water right from there. That's clean water. And so we're working to protect that water. We do all kinds of other fun stuff, like we have medicine gatherings and um, what else do we do? Like healing walks. And we're always looking to partner. We do research projects. So just check out our website, keepersofthewater.ca. Um, but I'll wrap it up there and I'm going to pass it over to Brian with Council of Canadians. Who, um, so he can tell you guys a little bit about the organization Council of Canadians. So thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. <clears throat> My name is Brian Sawyer. I'm with the local chapter of Council of Canadians. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here. I'm really honored to be here. I want to acknowledge all the hard work that our chapter has put into helping to organize this symposium. And of course, we also have the national organization which has funded uh, the, the proceedings. So I, I'm very appreciative of, of them. And I'd just like to say a little bit about them. The national organization was founded, I think in 1985 and they've been working and I do need some notes for this sometimes here, uh, but through collective action and grassroots organizing to challenge corporate power and advocate for people and our and and our planet, quite literally. And uh, our Edmonton chapter, there, oh yeah, and there's 50 chapters across the nation, each one involved in, in issues that are important in their regions and in, in their cities. So we're really glad to be one of those chapters. Our chapter has been around for more than 20 years, and we have treated water as, as a really important issue consistently. We also, this is another proud tradition of partnering with other like-minded uh, organizations to uh, address issues. We worked with uh, Pesticide-Free Edmonton to stop the uh, uh, cosmetic pesticides that are being applied to just to kill the dandelions and then run into our water system. Um, we've uh, partnered with Canadian Parks and Wilderness and Alberta Environment Network to stop the coal mining, or at least help stop the coal mining, or halt it for a little while anyway, and to stop the transfer of, of our parks to somebody else. So uh, we're carrying on a good tr tr tradition tonight. But our chapter, and just like you said, Jesse, water is so important to us. It's, it's, it's always been one of our long-term priorities. Um, so uh, protecting our valuable water resources. Um, uh, we are here tonight in part to um, make industry accountable and government. So as we learned in the first symposium, it's not just industry, it's also government not living up, not being accountable, not making people be accountable. And so we're here really tonight to, to spread the word about that, uh, make them or help them realize that they have commitments to meet to all Canadians and not just to their own shareholders. Um, we and we are a local uh, chapter. We're a growing chapter. We're thriving. We have a dozen to fifteen active members. We could, we always uh, would welcome uh, more more of you to get involved with us in any way that you like. Um, we're trying to fight for a healthy environment and for a sustainable environment for our kids and our grandkids, and that's why I, that's why I'm here, and that's why most of us are here in our chapter. And there's many ways that you can you can find out about us on Facebook on our website at councilofcanadians.ca, uh, email us at edmonton at yahoo.ca, um, all kinds of ways to get through to us and get on our newsletter or donate, donate to us. I'll give you more information about that at the end, but uh, I think now it's time to just move on with the proceedings. So uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you for thank joining you, Brian. Us, all of you. Um,
sorry, I, I believe <laughs> I think there's a bit of a confusion here. Um, okay, I, anyway, thank you for joining us both in person and online. Uh, it's been um, a real rocky road for a lot of us. And I know that uh, those of us who have been involved in climate change action and particularly watching what's happening to the, the water around the world, not just here in Canada, it's, it's, it's a, it is um, a, a very troubling story, a human tragedy really that caused by humans. And, um, you know, I um, jokingly mentioned in the chat that, we have to there's this time thing that we have to stick to and um you know I, I we all have to kind of stick to the agenda and and um you know we it's just it's just reality but the the, the serious part of it is is that um like our elder did mention to us it it, it is sobering times um, and so my role is here to, to not only introduce the speakers that are coming up, but I wanted to bring us back to what I was told is um, um, we have to always bring some laughter and, and we can't be too serious because it is, even if it is hard times, I, I think that our people, my ancestors, no matter how dismal it was and couldn't find no food and we were possibly facing starvation, we managed to laugh we managed to bring hope and that's the message that i think is important that um we're not the story's not done yet you still have your part to play and i still have my part to play and i'm not done yet i'm 58 jesse's not done you know all these wonderful people you, you're going to hear from tonight they're doing their part to, to push it and we're all doing our part to make sure that the story doesn't end here it's just the beginning and so I want to encourage all of you to remember that there is hope and um, it is it is hard, but it it's not the greatest troubles that I think where humanity has grown heroes. And that's what I always tell my students because I teach too, and that uh, we're living in a period where we're birthing heroes because this is the time and this is the kind of environment where heroes are, are going to be born and you may be one of them, all right? So tonight, uh, we're gonna be hearing from four speakers on indigenous rights, knowledge, and tailings. We're excited, as, as Jesse mentioned, Mike Mercury, my, my dear sister, Sue Durange, speaks highly of him, of a community that we're gonna start someday, and so I may be living with him someday. Who knows in the community we're gonna start? <laughs> Cleo Reese, uh, these two are gonna be speaking to us in person, uh, live from Edmonton, but we also have uh, Jean Lomcourt, as well as Daniel Tisley, who will be talking to us again, just like I am online. And they'll be speaking on uh, it's 15 minutes, supposedly each of us have to stick to. And my role is I have to time you. And, and, and I'm already gone over mine. So I'm obviously really not good at this role. They may fire me the next time. So anyway, as, as part of this, the, 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 another part of it is uh, we're gonna end the evening by um, asking you, our participants, and those of you who feel strongly about what you're gonna hear tonight, is you're gonna wanna take at action. There's an invitation that's going out that you're gonna take action in solidarity with those of us who are organizing to protect what's happening downstream and uh, of the tar sands and to push against these regulations that are really impacting the human rights of indigenous peoples along that route and uh, could potential, like, potentially allow the release of these very toxic, uh, untreated, well, they're saying they're treated, but um, if you watched and you were with us the last webinar, uh, that's, um, that's very questionable in terms of what are we gonna have in our water supply. So we need to take a stand on this. And But we're gonna, more on that later, um, I'm gonna pass it on to Jesse to introduce our first speaker, Mike Mercury. All right, so take it so away, So I'm gonna get right to it and do the introduction. Um, so Mike, Mike Mercury is a member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nations, land-based learning instructor, hand game instructor, and presently a graduate student of the University of Saskatchewan School of Environment and Sustainability Master's Energy Security Program. 
Mike lives in Fort Chippewan, Treaty 8, and works as a contract worker. He has coordinated First Nations land-based learning camps over for over 10 years with the ACFN, MCFN, CPDFN, Fort Chip Métis, and Living Sky School Division out of Fort Battleford, Saskatchewan. Mike is co-creating a new community high school, and they are starting a new First Nation school division for their community. Mike is a board of director for three first uh, for three nations fisheries. He's a seasoned land user, hunter, trapper, fisherman, and all around great guy. <laughs> so we'll uh, hand it over to you, Mike, and we're so happy to have you here. Yes. Hello. Um, my name is Mike Mercury, a member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nations. First off, I'd just like to say that. We're on the Treaty 8 territories, showing respect for all the First Nations of the area, the Métis peoples, um, wherever they may be here. Um, I'm Dennis Otlane, so I'll, I'll start off with that. Dennis Otlane meaning, um, the word actually means man and land and one. The word Dennis Otlane is, isn't, does not separate man from land. It's actually the exact same thing. There is no um, differentiating me from the trees, me from the earth, me from the grass, me from the animals, and me from the insects. There is no difference in stating that Dene Sotlane means man's flow with the land. So basically the essence of who I am is that I'm a man of the land. Um, when I was young, they actually, I actually, we made fun of that. When they said, oh, you're a man of the land, you know, oh, we laughed. And, it was funny. Um, it was later described that you are the land is how it was re, uh, retold to me. And um, from there, <coughs> my journey started a little um, different than most, um, but similar to many in a lot of ways. Tonight, we're here to talk about tailings and what they're planning on doing and talking about, uh, I guess, releasing it into the, the river and uh, treating it enough so they can do so. All I can say is in my experience in working up there and working with industry and working with the government and working with First Nations, um, I work with the Industry Relations Corporation for the Athabasca Chippewa First Nations. <clears throat> I work directly with uh, our band in doing EIAs, Environmental Impact Assessments, um, for the Alberta government. Um, I worked right along scientists. I went right on the land, did water testing, did uh, vegetation testing, um, sediment testing. So I went out there and did these things right with uh, the scientists and got the data, <clears throat> sent stuff in and um, created the, I guess, the land-based, uh, what's it called? The community-based monitoring program for, for CHIP uh, came from that, came from us wanting to know the scientific data of our land. The indigenous and us knew what was going on because we live there and we see this stuff happening firsthand. Um, this presentation was created by Carla Davidson for the area, I guess they're calling themselves the Area Regional First Nations, which is Fort Mackay First Nations. Uh, next page, please. Uh, Athabasca, Chippewan, Fort Mackay, and who am I missing? Chippewan Prairie out of Janvier. So what this right here is showing, <coughs> it shows how the water flows into the area. So I wish I had one of those pointers. The big arrow on the bottom, the very middle, um, shows the bend for where the Athabasca River flows into the Delta. It switches and goes this way and then goes up. All that green is all delta and vegetation that takes in the water flowing up from the Athabasca. <laughs> a little bit gets, uh, gets filtered out through, I guess it goes through the area. As you see all the little lakes and all the uh, little rivers, this almost acts like a little bit of a filter that sends it north doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, cleaning out all the toxins out of there. That's not what it's actually meant to do. 
part of what it does is creates a area that we use for hunting and trapping and medicine gathering. A lot of the flow that goes back there that we've recorded um, is dropping. So a lot of the areas that are blue close to these lakes are now actually grasslands. The area that shows Lake Claire and in between Mamway Lake, where the two arrows split, are the only two places that actually have the bodies of water. I'm just getting over that crazy cold that was going on. So one of the things that we also did notice right from, I guess, the late 60s from when they started the Bennett Dam was the water drop. The water drop and the Delta dry out. The death of a Delta is a document that was made for it. So you can look that up and go watch that. Our people are in there. So you can see that right from the get-go before oil sands, um, the First Nations in the area have been upfront about not wanting this destruction. They're not wanting any of these things happen. So what the government did since then was mitigate their ways around our rights and came up with the impact benefit agreements. Next page. <coughs> so here the Chippewa and Prairie have an area called, they call it Sag D Alley. The whole area in the blue, Janvier is located right in the middle of that. And um, Sag D is seam assisted gravity drainage. This is where they stick the pipes in the ground, steam it up and suck it out. So what happens is pockets of water in the ground gets, gets taken out. So layers of water drop. If all the vegetation from underneath is being sucked out, all the vegetation on top is drying up. So it's, it's cycle, it's happening and it's being recorded. <laughs> the thing about the SAG-D with it is because the oil is deeper. So they can't surface mine it. They have to drill further for it. Um, they, they try to hide the idea that there is no surface destruction and no open pit mining and that it looks a little better. I suggest you go there and go have a look uh, as what they did from SAG-D and go look at a picture from 15 years ago to the area now. Next one, please. Next picture. Right here is one of them. Not SAG-D, but Fort, Mac Fort Mackay. Fort Mackay is the little red dot right there in the middle. It's a small little pink area. <laughs> That's right here, 2015. That's what they're surrounded by. And that's just to give you an, a view of what we've been dealing with and what they've been talking about since, well, 2006, since the boom and stuff started. <laughs> the very top up there, the lower part is uh, Lake Claire. And that's the edge of the uh, Wood Buffalo National Park. So it just shows from the bottom picture here just how close um, development and exploration has been encroaching further, further north to, I guess I would say, the Canadian Shield region. Next, next slide. 1984. And then the next picture will show a recent one. If you go back and forth to that picture, is the picture taken in the exact same spot? <clears throat> all that area with the, can you go back to the other one? Those are all the tailing ponds, the big bright brown ones right there. The river flows right there, you can see it, and you can see how close the tailings is. There is seepage into the water, into the Athabasca. It is leaking already. We're already dealing with that. So as uh, Dr. Timoney explained uh, several years back, and as Jesse had mentioned earlier, with stuff that's flowing every year, it's equivalent to an Exxon Valdez oil spill every year. That's what we deal with. So when you have things like water droppage and cancers and different types of things, well, the evidence is all there. The science has shown that it's there. It's what's causing it. They told us cancer, the cancer causing stuff going on in Fort Chip is done by Old Santa Belt. They right out just said it. They didn't say stop denying it. They're like, okay, here you go. It's, it's fact. And guess what? They said, we got an IBA with your first station, so there's really nothing that could be done about it. 
said, so they use impact benefit agreement to navigate and mitigate around our treaty rights because our treaty rights is legally the only thing that can stop industry development. The reason why they have all deals with First Nations throughout the whole entire country is because they need us. They need our signature. My treaty states otherwise on, on treaty territory to develop need my permission to do so. When the First Nations decide to disagree, that's when the court cases happen. That's when the mitigation starts. <clears throat> that's when bigger money comes into play. They refused 10 million and said, okay, then have 30. They refused 30, they said, okay, have 40. Everybody has their limit. So did we. They bought and bought into it and continued to develop. There's only a couple of us in the nations that actually disagree with the whole thing. Of course, I'm one of them. <clears throat> and they still went ahead with some things um, as they explained to our elders and our people and how the world needs the economy and the things are changing that we need to do these deals in order for the world to survive and uh, keep us, I guess, a first world country is the best way I can see it as is what it's doing is keeping us a first world country with the third world conditions. Have you been to reserves? Have you seen how they treat us? Now they want the deals, right? The IBA is that uh, state without the treaty signing, it's illegal for them to do so. And we are the ones that are again, left up fronting on the front lines and watching it happen as it goes and being part of that. <clears throat> I used to work for Syncrude. Um, I became one of, their, one of their truck drivers. I got my mine ops certificate, basically, uh, I got trained for six to eight months to go work in the mines and all that and drive their trucks and do all of their, all of that work. <clears throat> I got off the trucks and stopped and went home um, in 2007. And from there started a little bit of my, I guess, uh, I prefer to call the grassroots speaking against what I saw was going on. And um, it awoken a lot of people. And a lot of things and things happened from those times. I like to say that in Fort Chip was where the stone hit the, hit the pond and, and it rippled out. What's happening to us, I'm going to say it again, I said it 12 years ago, is happening to you guys now. What's happening to us and what's going on there, you guys are now feeling the effects. They've called it now climate crisis. And we said that these things were going to happen. And we said that if we don't change how we're relating to our earth, we are going to pay for it. And we are paying for it. Maybe right now, not all of us are seeing it firsthand, but the people around the world are paying for it um, with floods and people close to the coastlines that are now in debt in the billions because of this. So the effects goes globally. It's no longer a fortune issue. It's no longer um, my issue. It's now yours. So where this stone rippled out is now affecting everyone across the entire globe. So when I tell people in Florida, if I ever go there to say, hey, you know what, in Fort Chip, they're close to us, I'm sorry. When I go to India, the whole village that was flooded out, if I can find a victim, can I go there and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry my First Nations signed an IBA. I'm sorry we want to live in a first world setting. And I'm sorry that I'm using paper straws now instead of plastic and hope that my ways doesn't further kill a lot of people because now their blood's on my hands. And it is. I have to live with that which is why I do what I do, <clears throat> which is why I started land-based learning, which is why we got a new school division coming into our community, <clears throat> which is why I'm doing my master's in energy security for the School of Environment Sustainability at the University of Saskatchewan. It's not just um, trying to 
sound like I'm actually doing something about it. I'm actually doing something about it. I live in a tiny home. I moved out of our, we don't have one of those big house. I just got chickens. So I got um, some eggs. I have two gardens. I teach our kids how to live on a land and how to respect these things and how to respect our elders. My daughter was giving a, an older lady Dene lessons. She's six. The school we started and how we wanted to do things was because in order to decolonize, we have to get rid of the colonizer. And that's just it. Getting rid of the how they taught us and the, and the ways they shown us. How are we gonna do that? Our way of life, my way of life. My culture and my way of life is not a past tense. I am still here. I ain't going anywhere. I have treaty. As long as I have treaty, you will exist. This Canada, this country, the Dominion is what it is because of treaty. And that's the respect. You're a treaty people. You may not be status, but you're treaty. You're in Canada. So that was one of those things that I, I learned to respect is uh, no matter what, who we are, where we are on this planet, we're going to be affected by it for what we do to it. And I know with, with the companies wanting to know what our concerns are, I've learned there's been nothing but a mitigation. It's not really addressing my concerns. It's not really taking care of uh, poisoning the water. A little bit took care of me being able to do the things I do. Going out on the land, teaching our kids how to live with the environment, in the environment, and being able to do so with some of their funds was a little bit of a, a catch-22 for me because industry was funding our kids to go be on the land. Now, what is, that sounds really ridiculous now when I think about it. At the time, my elders had told me that I had to swallow my pride. I had to forget of all the things I had said. <clears throat> I had to take this industry money. I had to go show our kids how to properly be on the land and relate to it. And I succeeded. I succeeded in a way that we now have our own school division that's going to start up there, the First Nations School Division. We got rid of Northland School Division out of our community. We started there, and we're coming for the rest of our communities in our region. Janvier, Anzac, Conklin, their Northlands will be removed from the region before I pass on to the next world. <clears throat> I can say that now because I've done it. Four years ago, we said we were going to do that. We needed to get Northlands out of Fort Chip. One of my first steps was working with the Red Cross in Northlands to figure out how we were going to do that. And we did. We did, did it better than they did. <clears throat> we learned the school system. We learned how the curriculum works. And we just did it better. Government liked it. And they said, we're giving you guys a new school division and all the fixings that come with it. So now that they lost all of their uh, funding, it's going to be going to us. So now we're going to be able to create our own First Nations school division and begin proper decolonizations of the next generation. Because once that happens, hopefully they're going to be able to uh, save the rest of the planet for us because we totally messed it up. So. Um. <coughs> Go to the next slide if you can. Uh, there's more of it on here to see. A lot of this for me had just been information for you. Because from having tailings going into the water and seeing what this could do firsthand, um, which is why we say no, which is why we don't want these things. And you understand that I'm only going to leave it and finish with this. If they can invent water, hell yeah. Do it. Yeah, by all means, I agree. But 
No, they're not going to invent water. They have not invented water. So tailings and re releasing back into the environment. Anything they say along it is is lies. Uh, it cannot be done. It scientifically cannot be done. When you remove all the elements and all the stuff out of the water, it's, it can only be recycled so many times and put it back into the environment before it's an actual labeled toxin which is why they have tailing lakes, which is why the whole area is surrounded by all that. They can't actually do anything with it. So, yeah, just, I'll end it at that. Oh, one last thing. I, I wanted to say uh, this really, really, really embarrassed me um, and people I know. And I had to pull them aside and really give it to them. They were offering $50 million to take over and take responsibility of the tailings. The four chip Métis were about to take the deal. $50 million are gonna give them to say, it's your problem now. And that's it. That's all it would have been. They would have handed it over and walked away. That, that's all it costed us was $50 million. <laughs> <clears throat> to get rid of a, I think it's estimated a close to a trillion dollars to actually clean it all up and put all the trees back, put all the water back, put all the land back and make it all um, just livable again. Close to a trillion. $50 million is what they were going to sell the tailings responsibility for. Our First Nations are about to talk about it when they're like, hey, no. Yeah, so just to keep that in mind, that they were trying to pound off the responsibility. Thank you. Um, I don't know if uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm just trying to follow the agenda here. Um so it looks like Wendy's, we, we're running short on time, so we're just going to zip along here. But Mike, <coughs> I, I would want to ask if the rest of your presentation is available. We want you back. Like This just feels like a sampling of a longer conversation we need to have. So let's plan some gatherings and, and get uh, planning on that. So we'll keep you guys all posted. So Wendy, I'll pass it over to you now. Okay, so yeah, sorry. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Jean Lomcourt. Uh, she's an Indigenous Denisulan, and um, hearing the definition of what that means, it just, it just, it's amazing. Uh, she's a registered member or a member of Treaty 8 with the Fort McKay First Nation in Alberta. She was traditionally raised on the land of her parents, Norbert Lomcourt and Anne Lomcourt, Nee Boucher, on the east bank of the Athabasca, Athabasca River, uh, so she probably would know firsthand the homeland territory called Poplar Point. She spent years residing in the Northwest Territories as an isolated community, in an isolated community, pardon me, of uh, Letsuke, correct me, and in the city of Yellowknife. Since returning to Fort McKay, uh, Fort Mackay, actually, I think it is. I'm really butchering all this. She has worked tirelessly advocating for the, the Denisulan traditional territory and the environment uh, by representing her community through many different forums, communities, committees, and working groups, including serving as a co-chair for Keepers of the Water Board of Directors. So welcome, Jean. We're looking very much forward to your presentation today. So um, welcome. And I'm Marcy Cho, uh, Jean Lumkert Hushe, Fort Mackay, it's a Treaty 8, then a Sosalini Territory, it's a, yeah, Sachia Moi, Adam Boucher, yeah, Treaty 8 signatory, um, a, as I said, I'm, I'm uh, I'm on a her her hereditary lineage to Adam Bushy signatory to Treaty 8 and so I uh, was born and raised in, um, I was born in Fort McMurray and um, I originate from Poplar Point, which is uh, 
our homeland territory, which is just uh, in between Fort McMurray and and uh, Fort Fort Chip. Uh, you'll have to excuse me because I I'm on the road right now. I'm making my way home to Fort Mackay. I uh, I stopped uh, on the halfway point and just uh, to get onto this uh, symposium. Uh, that's my introduction. So um, I just want to speak about uh, the tailings. I don't really have a, um, any um, any documents or anything to bring forward and share with you, but I just want to share my my uh, story, my experience. I'm, uh, I have been involved with, uh, with uh, advocating for uh, clean water or Mother Earth and so forth. And essentially that just means that uh, we need all these, we need uh, clean water and earth to maintain our, our culture, our language, because as a Dene person, Dene, Dene means, uh, you know, you're connected to the land as a person, um, like Mike said. And I really wish I was there in person. I wasn't aware that this was could be a, um, a uh, I wasn't aware that we were, we could be in person. But anyways, nevertheless, I'm here. So what I want to talk about is, uh, is that the tailings pond is, is, uh, actually um, it's it's uh, infringing on our treaty and Aboriginal rights and our inherent rights because our inherent rights are supersede all other rights uh, in so-called Canada and um, as Mike did say that uh, impact benefits agreement has has silenced our, our voices uh, in order for for uh, industry to move forward with all the so-called projects that they have on our indigenous lands in our homeland territories in our backyards and we're the ones that are actually being exposed to it firsthand and we're the ones that are living it, breathing it and uh, tasting it uh, because that's how close we are and um, you know, our, our treaty rights have already have far been surpassed, have far been surpassed as far as infringement on our rights goes. And so uh, the government gives too much power to these, uh, these corporations to, for them to, uh, to step all over us and, and throw money in, in the pot and uh, get everybody, their, their uh, thing is uh, to, uh, divide and conquer and that's being used in many many ways as far as uh industry goes um and we're always the ones that are are uh, are dealt with uh, all the impacts and we we're the ones that are suffering and and dying due to these uh impacts of of our traditional lands because uh our lives depend on on land and clean water. So, you know, uh, we've been aware all along that the tailings ponds have been leaking and leaching into the into the river since its first inception, like the, from the first time they started building it because they use sand as a, as a dike. And as you know, water and sand, water can easily maneuver its way through anything. And water is a very, very powerful element and nothing can stop water as we can see, as we uh, witnessed all the uh, atrocities on the other side of the world and there's nothing they could do to stop the water from rushing in and all the uh, floods and so forth. So, uh, you know, the tailings is, is something that really impacted our community and not only our community but the community downstream of us and the uh the connections that we have with the communities down the stream is is through the athabasca river these are our connections 
um, to our ancestors and to each other because we've been pulled off the banks of Athabasca River and, and stolen and all our children have been stolen from the parents and, and put into residential schools. Um, as everybody knows, like those are things that have been done to us to, so they can steal our resources. And now it's the other way around where they're stealing the land and water from our future generations. So the, the tailings is, is, uh, is uh, a means of destroying our culture and our, everything that's about indigenous peoples in order for, for the world to prosper and live a comfortable lifestyle. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's just, it's very, very uh, disheartening that for many years, for the past 40 to 50 years, people have been crying out on, on all the impacts that are been enforced on our peoples, but and yet we still have to, uh, we're still being told to adapt and it's colonization. Uh, why do we have to adapt? Uh, we have already adapted into colonization through the residential school era, and we have already adapted through many, 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 many changes as far as uh, the world is getting to be more into technology. And uh, it's, it's all from, it all derives from, from the lands and which is uh, destroying us and we need to, we need to better manage our waters. And uh, yeah, this is, it's all about water and yeah. Um, I'm gonna have to cut it short here. Thanks for inviting me and I'll stay on if there's any questions or so forth. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate. Well, thank you very much for that, Jean. All right, now, sorry, my granddaughter, she's just coughing. Everybody's got this terrible cough right now. Um, it, it is it is really unsettling, everything that's happening around the world, and particularly those of us have been mindful and watching the, the impacts that, that have really impacted all of the human family. And um, all we can do is just hope that some sense of, of um, I don't know, that sense some sense of common sense <laughs> dad used to say common sense is something but i don't think common sense we don't have it anymore anyway so the next speaker that um we want to bring up and thank you so much jane I, I i really appreciated everything you shared with us and um i, I really sense your sincerity and your your um your understanding that you know we really need to work together and that's what i'm hearing from all the speakers tonight so i'm hoping that the message is going out there to all of our listeners and all of our participants and uh, again to remind you all of those who are online please post any questions or comments in the q a box um, if there is time at the end we will be providing opportunity for your your questions and comments to be to be responded to by the participants so daniel Tisleli, oh geez, I practiced it too. He's a Casho Gatin Bene from the Radico, aka Fort Good Hope. He is a retired lawyer who currently works with the Indigenous communities and organizations on issues related to Indigenous rights and land protection. <clears throat> Daniel is also the Northwest Territories Outreach Manager with Keepers of the Water and helps raise awareness about the Northwest Territories issues and concerns as it pertains to water, as well as building partnerships and working to protect water. Daniel has been advocating for action on climate change for over a decade and is a novice trainer in nonviolent direct action tactics and strategy with a focus on environmental justice and Indigenous sovereignty. So welcome, Daniel. Uh, I, I just have to remind you, and I haven't been doing my best at this job, I'm supposed to be reminding people um, at the five minutes and one people, um, one minute that your time is coming up, You're, you have 15 minutes, but um, let's just try to be as flexible, but as able to finish on time. 
as we want to. So welcome, Daniel. Please, um, participants, uh, welcome him with us. And um, I'm just looking forward to this presentation too. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, I'll try to hustle. Uh, so my name is Daniel Teselli. I'm Kasha Gotene. Uh, we're Dene. Dene is a very large group of people uh, across the whole continent, but there are a lot. Uh, on the banks of the big river, the Mackenzie River. So we are directly downstream. We're very far downstream, but we are downstream from, from the tar sands and all of the other industrial activity and water usage like damming that is happening in the south. Um, and that's not just us. There are many Dene and Métis and Inuvialuit communities who are downstream and will eventually feel those impacts if this tailings release does proceed. Uh, and this, just to give some context, this this what they call the Mackenzie River watershed or Mackenzie River Basin it is massive. It, it includes almost the entire area of land that is claimed within the political boundaries of the Northwest Territories and also land that's considered parts of northern Alberta, BC and parts of Yukon is all part of that watershed. It's one of the last pristine ecosystems on the continent. Um, and it has massive impacts on the Arctic Ocean. I think it's something like 11% of the river outflow to the Arctic Ocean comes from this big river and has impacts on things like, like ocean circulation. So whatever happens upstream and makes its way down th this way has huge impacts on areas of land that really need to be maintained and has spin-off impacts on dozens of Indigenous nations. And that's really important to keep in mind. Um, I want to talk uh, as briefly as I can about some of the specific uh, rights aspects to this issue. So um, there's this huge tailings problem. It's been growing for years. Canada did nothing about it. Um, and now the proposal is to dump the treated tailings into the, into the river, into the watershed. And I think what's important for people to, to know about this and to really focus in on is that this is not just industry and the government of Alberta. The government of Canada, Canada's federal government, has a role to play in this proposal and in this process. Specifically, they have proposed amendments to their Fisheries Act that would legalize this release of treated tailings. So right now, because even the treated tailings are toxic to fish and aquatic life, releasing it is illegal under Canada's Fisheries Act. Uh, so they want to introduce regulations under that act that would legalize the release of those treated tailings. Um, I want to talk about this from a rights perspective and a perspective that's acknowledging really that Indigenous rights and, and the views toward, towards that at the international level is changing rapidly. And Canada's approach to Indigenous rights is really premised on uh, a very outdated, antiquated colonial approach uh, and does not meet these new international standards. And I think we need to talk about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples if we're going to have that conversation. And, and that is a document, it's a declaration that was passed by the UN's General Assembly in 2007. And it's intended to be a statement on the minimum standards for the rights of Indigenous peoples and kind of related principles and mechanisms like redress mechanisms for loss and theft of land or destruction of land. Uh, and it's supposed to give a minimum standard for states to follow. That's really who that declaration is intended for. It's intended for states, the countries of the world, and it, it sets that minimum standard and the obligations they have to maintain that minimum standard of, of Indigenous rights and their dealings with Indigenous peoples. So Canada's federal government made a very strange commitment to implement that declaration in 2016, and they passed legislation on that last summer in 2021. And that legislation uh, really does two things. The first thing it does is that it requires them to produce an action plan that describes how they will implement that declaration. 
And it also requires them to ensure that all their legislation, all of Canada's federal legislation is consistent with the declaration. Uh, and so I need to point out that that includes the Fisheries Act, that is legislation of Canada's federal government. Uh, one thing I wanna highlight is that the uh, Denny Nation at their annual assembly this past summer uh, uh, passed a resolution that opposes the declaration and that federal legislation. And Denny Nation is a political organization that advocates on issues that impact kind of the collective rights of Dene, and it's mostly Dene within the boundaries of the Northwest Territories. They don't represent the rights of any individual Dene nations. Uh, they advocate on those collective issues. But their primary concern uh, that was brought to the table where the chiefs were uh, is around Article 46 of that declaration. And that's an article that was introduced by states, by the countries of the world, after Indigenous peoples and other experts had drafted the declaration. And one of the things it does is it clarifies that none of the rights in the declaration can be used by Indigenous peoples to, to impact the territorial integrity of states or the political unity of states. So basically, it says that Indigenous peoples don't have rights under that declaration to be fully sovereign and to break away from a country and start their own country. Um, so Denny Nation had issues with, with that aspect of the declaration. Uh, they also have issues with Canada's legislation to implement the declaration and called on Canada to repeal that legislation. But their resolution uh, uh, makes it clear that they still support the implementation of the doctrine of free prior and informed consent. And that's a doctrine that is woven into the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but does not come from that declaration. Um, and so it exists independently of that declaration. And I think that's very important to, to point out. So I wanna talk about what is free prior and informed consent. It's a, a doctrine that requires states before they engage in action that would impact the rights of indigenous people. It requires states to engage in a process with those indigenous people to obtain their consent to this proposed action. And that consent needs to be free in the sense that it is not obtained by bullying or coercion or other underhanded tactics. Uh, it needs to be prior in the sense that Indigenous peoples need to consent before government actually moves forward with the action. Uh, it can't just be like a checklist um, that government is going through and assuming that consent will be obtained. They actually need to wait for consent before they move forward. And that consent needs to be informed. So that means that Indigenous peoples need to have all the information that's required to make a good decision they need to have enough time to make that decision to go over the information to prepare their position. Uh, and they may need resources to make that decision. They may need things like uh, legal advice. They may need time and resources for things like environmental monitor. So those are all aspects of this process of free prior and informed consent. And this, this doctrine is, uh, there's kind of two, two aspects to it. Um, that are highlighted by international law experts. So on the one hand, uh, there are some cases, and this includes how this doctrine is used in that UN declaration sometimes, where the requirement on states is to go through this process to try to seek to obtain, it's a language that's used sometimes, to seek to obtain the free prior and informed consent of impacted indigenous peoples. But if that consent is not obtained, the, the, the state, the government, may still be able to go ahead with that action. But there are other situations, particularly where the risk of impacts to the indigenous peoples is very severe, where consent is an absolute requirement. States cannot proceed with the proposal until they obtain the free prior and informed consent of impacted indigenous peoples. And I think this is critical to point out because um, uh, from what we've been hearing from Canada and Canada's politicians, it sounds like they're approaching that doctrine more as a duty to consult what exists currently in Canadian law, where consent is not required. And if consent is withheld by Indigenous peoples, government can go ahead and do it anyway. And that is not what free prior and informed consent is. So 
that doctrine is woven into the UN Declaration, but it exists independently of it. And I think it's important to point out in this particular situation, when we're looking at these proposed amendments to the Fisheries Act, that that doctrine as it's used in that UN Declaration uh, does in this case require free prior and informed consent of impacted Indigenous peoples. And uh, particularly, you could look at Articles 18 and 19, which, when read together, uh, create procedural rights for Indigenous peoples to participate in state legislative and policy initiatives that would impact their rights, and requires states to obtain free prior and informed consent from Indigenous peoples before proceeding with these initiatives. And that consent needs to be obtained uh, by from representatives of the Indigenous peoples that are selected by us. The state does not decide who represents Indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples decide who represents them. They tell the state that, and that's who needs to be engaged with on this process. Uh, also relevant is Article 32.2, which requires free prior and informed consent in uh, in cases where uh, uh, there's going to be an approval of any project affecting Indigenous people's lands or territories or other resources, uh, and particularly including resources like water. And both of these, these, these kind of sets of articles, 18 and 19, and then also 32.2, there's analysis from the International Law Association's Rights of Indigenous Peoples Committee. They released a couple of, of reports on this, uh, and they explain that, that this is a legal requirement. There is a legal requirement to obtain the free prior and informed consent of Indigenous peoples in situations like this. And what we're talking about with these Fisheries Act regulations is precisely that type of situation. So when we look at all this together, uh, you can conclude that if Canada is serious about implementing the UN Declaration, and also if it's serious about adhering to the legislation that it passed last summer, that Canada's Parliament passed, that requires all of its federal legislation, including its Fisheries Act, to be consistent with the Declaration, then it absolutely needs to obtain the consent, the free prior and informed consent of impacted Indigenous nations before it proceeds with introducing these regulations under the Fisheries Act. And this requirement for consent, I think, uh, uh, exists even in the absence of the UN Declaration. Again, because that doctrine uh, exists independently of the UN Declaration. Um, and people do argue that this requirement for free prior and informed consent is something that it now exists under customary international law. Uh, so the last thing I'll say is that it's not appropriate for the government of Canada to unilaterally determine uh, which Indigenous nations uh, are or potentially will be impacted by this decision. Um, and, and that's something that needs to be addressed in this discussion of rights of the UN Declaration and of free prior and informed consent. And my thoughts are that all of the people who are directly impacted by this uh, should be engaged with by the state and that the free prior and informed consent of all impacted Indigenous nations needs to be obtained before they can proceed with these regulations. And that would include all the people downstream and all the people in the region who are uh, uh, impacted by these tailings. Um, and so I, I would encourage all of you Canadians out there to uh, make sure that that your your representatives and politicians in Ottawa understand what that means, understand what free prior and informed consent is, and understand the obligations they have put on themselves uh, when they passed and enacted that legislation last year. So I will leave it at that for now. Masi, thank you. Oh, thank you, Daniel. That was really good. And thank you, Jean. Um, and Mike for sharing your experience, and knowledge with us. Um, we have to move to our final speaker now. And uh, it's been a, a, a good evening of listening to some wonderful people really sharing from their heart some of the concerns that we have. Uh, our next speaker is Elder Cleo Reese. He, uh, she is going to 
take a minute to introduce the action. Uh, we really need to go back to as um, as Daniel has mentioned. You know, what are we doing here? We're allowing politicians to dump these tailings, and so uh, as part of this series, we're we're continuing to ask our viewers, our participants, and, and those of you who are concerned with what's happening to our environment here in Canada, particularly what, this is what's happening around the world, to get involved and to make sure that if you're standing in solidarity with downstream uh, communities who oppose the dumping of improperly treated tailings into the Athabasca River, because as you've heard tonight, that is it, it is going to affect much more than just the river. It's going into... It's going into the actual Arctic Ocean, 11% uh, and it gets right down to it, that's significant. Uh, so we're inviting you to send a letter to Minister Stephen Jabot to demand that the tailing affluent regulations be drafted. Do not allow the dumping of improperly treated tailings into the Athabasca River. Indigenous community leaders and members are already feeling the cumulative impacts of climate change and upstream industrial activity on their health and traditional cultural practices. My goodness, you could see deformed fish coming out of some of the pictures. Tailings are and will continue to impact downstream communities. It's unacceptable to continue to accept the sacrifice of Northern Indigenous communities and lands to an industry profit. We're, we're violating the human rights of, of these, these human beings. So you can access the letter to Minister Jabot by scanning the QR code on the screen or by clicking on the link in the chat. If you're attending in person, the link will be sent to you following the event. Now, we're gonna to listen to our final speaker for the evening. Um, and it's back to you, Jesse. Thank you, Wendy. You're such an, uh, an amazing host. I love listening to you. Um, you have a really nice voice. So I wanted to thank you all for sticking with us. We're actually not too far off time. So thank you all in person. You guys are a wonderful crowd and thank you all online. Um, Mike wanted me to part of part of the joke. So if you guys didn't catch the joke from the beginning, the really bad joke about Halloween. Um, and this is if you're sitting in a room with, you know, possibly a room of government or non indigenous people, perhaps. And so the joke is like, it's a Halloween joke. So it's like, boo, or boo, you know, and so what I did was uh, my version of it was um, uh, co management or land back and so mike told me another one resource sharing <laughs> Ooh, scary <laughs> and it's true it's literally true i was in a meeting with government today and one of the topics was revenue sharing or resource sharing and that's not something that they want to do you know Mun municipalities and other places do not want to um share you know and it keeps indigenous people people in poverty um Moving on to our next presentation, but I wanted to catch you guys before, you know, in case anybody tries to leave early here. Keepers of the Water, we have an event coming up December 8th and 9th. If you want to conti like continue learning about this discussion of free prior informed consent, um, we're talking about undrip, personhood of rivers. We're hosting an in-person summit it's an in-person legal summit so you can find more information about that on our facebook page or, or on our website so i'm going to introduce cleo she's the last speaker of the evening thank you to all of the previous speakers thank you to jean you're amazing to mike and to daniel we appreciate you all so thank you cleo for joining us cleo was born in fort McMurray, alberta to Cree and Métis parents. She was raised in Edmonton and later moved to BC, where she raised a family of four children, and her children are amazing. Um, Cleo is a strong believer in advocacy and action and has been instrumental in many initiatives, including the first women's memorial march for missing and murdered women, missing murdered Indigenous women. She's a founding member of Keepers of the Athabasca Water, uh, Watershed Society, a current co chair and present executive member of the Athabasca Watershed Council, that should say Keepers of the Water. Um, and she's also a member of the Fort McMurray First Nation, Greg Wire, uh, Greg Wire Lake Watershed Elders Group. 
Cleo is a coordinator for the healing gathering for the land, water, and people. And she uh, is also one of the founders of the Tar Sands Healing Walk. Ariel Durange is also a founder of the Tar Sands Healing Walk. And Harry, Ariel's here in person, FYI. <laughs> um, and uh, an international, and I'm sorry, you guys, you know, what? this. I guess you're learning this about me. I get tired in the evening. So I'm like, oh. an internationally famous event produced by Keepers of the Athabasca, along with many other partners. So the, the Tar Sands Healing Walk became an international event. Um, they founded it in... Uh, the last one we had was in 2014. So the first one would have happened in 2009, I think. And uh, we're actually talking about hosting a Tar Sands Healing Walk for 2023. So that's all dependent on the kind of support we get. You know, we need resources for that. And, and we want to partner with organizations. But we've been we keep getting asked by people to have this Tar Sands Healing Walk. So that's on our radar. So thank you all. And I'm going to introduce, uh, I welcome you up Cleo and, and thank you for, for being here this evening. Oh, I love your spread. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, uh, my name is Cleo Reese. I, as Jesse said, I am from the Fort McMurray First Nation. Uh, I moved back to my home uh, community uh, around 2006. And um, I did spend a lot of time in BC and uh, and I, I did work in the downtown east side right there. And um, uh, the just quickly, I wanted to mention the uh, the issues that uh, are over there that deal with people living on the streets and people who are uh, disenfranchised, disempowered, and and uh, and then there was the the issues about women uh, disappearing or you know having uh, having had uh, met uh, untimely and violent ends and. Um, and yeah, that was, I, I did uh, organize that very first women's march that we had. And it was in 1992. And, uh, and, and that's when I was working there. And, and many years later, I came back home in 2006. And, um, and started hearing about what was going on with all the rapid development of the the oil sands and the um the fossil fuel industry and and how uh bitumen became a huge resource um and and it 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 just grew it was growing so rapidly that um it really changed a lot of what was going on in the north and it just brought me back um when I was in BC and there was, and this is in the 1970s, and there was talk about uh, liquefied natural gas that was going to be brought to Kitimat and, um, and then it would be, it would go out to the markets around the world. And, and I remember have, being involved in a lot of talks with the indigenous people in the, the North, the west area of bc who were really against that idea and uh and just because of the potential of the uh you know the the, the potential destructive nature of having liquefied natural gas uh you know being used being brought in huge quantities and on ships and so on and um and I mean, we've seen the extent of the oil spills and 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 what is going on. And then um, nowadays, I I it's come back, right? It that went away, and now it's back. People are are talking about liquefied natural gas going uh, overseas to replace, you know, you know the the oil that Russia brings in, you know. So. It just shows that there's there's going to be some way that um, 
that these companies are going to get their money's worth and um, out of uh, out of extraction at the cost of the people uh, who are living where they, you know, in these areas that is going to be affected. And here, because we live in the Northwest, uh, I mean, the Northern, actually Northeast of Alberta, and we've seen the huge as as we saw the slides that that Mike show about you know the 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 changes that have happened within a, a very you know short span of time, and uh, you look at the oil leases on a map and it covers just about every square inch of northern Alberta. It's not that every square inch is being developed, but it the potential is there. Also. Um, just to bring your attention to the um, the recent ruling uh, a couple of years ago with um, the Blueberry decision, um, and that was a really important uh, case that uh, that that was actually successful by the the Blueberry First Nation in Northern BC, uh, which is also a Treaty Eight um, uh, First Nation. And uh, and that was about the impact of the cumulative effects of what goes on with the oil and gas industry and how over time it affects them to the extent that their treaty rights are going to be completely ignored or, or rejected or not or, or um, uh, um, uh, not um, followed. Now, it's. Uh, bringing up the whole issue of treaty is to me is very important um daniel gave a really good background about the uh united nations declaration on indigenous rights of indigenous people and that includes agreements that have been made between sovereign nations such as uh you know the the um the king or the queen of england and um first nations in in this this area and uh, so that was uh, a really like a binding agreement that was signed in 1899. It's still valid today. But what is actually how how are those treaty rights actually being used or implemented and, and recognized uh, to the extent, like Mike said about have you gone to a, a reserve in northern Alberta or even anywhere in Alberta? And and you could see, you know, right where the highway ends, the reserve starts over here, all gravel roads. So, I mean, that all costs money, right? I mean, if you look at, um, you know, municipalities, they are all paved, you know, the roads are paved. They've got all the infrastructure they've got the running water they got they've got everything they need but you know that's a completely different situation and bring it back to um revenue sharing that was brought up uh by jesse there um yeah it is a, a big uh scary topic i'm sure um but it's something that um treaty 8 is actually really seriously looking at and I think it's probably a really good idea for them to do this and to really uh, to 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 I mean, if you look at the blueberry decision, it was uh, it was it was actually um, um, became law that that the people were their treaty rights were were being trampled on. And so, you know, there is a, a process in which they're actually getting um, their um some of this recognized and they and they get the the proper com compensation. So this is a very scary topic, I'm sure, for a lot of big industry. But I think it's something that has to be looked at uh, if we want to talk about sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty, it's something that's um, it's it's a very uh, it's a very big topic, and it's uh, it's something that we all need to really look at. Um, very carefully and and to go and I and I believe these are what the the First Nations are doing in Treaty 8 and elsewhere. Um, we look we talk about treaty rights and inherent rights. So that is the other thing. We we have the inherent rights as just being the first people of the land, you know, that 
this this was you know our our territory and it it we do not believe it's we've ever given it up it's uh it's something that we we use and um and i would like to also say uh congratulations and and also my very um good good feelings about hearing about the land-based learning programs that are going on and this is really important land-based learning programs in the schools is is really important if you if you go to schools or you've been involved in schools like i have you'll find that um maybe 80 percent of the the time that kids spend spend in school is not it's not productive just because you've got to manage all these kids, it's really hard to do that. I know I I was a teacher, so I've gone through that experience. But um, things that uh, you know, kids, children, or adults can relate to is uh, is getting back in touch with the land, and that is really important. And uh, as a, a land based teacher, you know, I've I've just I'm I'm not the the full I haven't done the full thing but I I take them on you know nature walks or something like that I I I do that sort of thing and uh you know I get the students to actually touch the tree you know and we actually thank the tree for all the work it's doing for us you know we feel that tree put our arms around it if we want to and and we we give it thanks you know because it's helping clear our our air it's looking after it's looking after us and all those trees all those forests it's so important it's it's helping us it's helping us breathe it's giving us it's giving us oxygen so these things are you know that that to get these kids back into touch with that to understanding our our whole connection with nature and what it means it's uh, so important. And then on the topic of education, uh, there are um, language programs that are going on. Uh, I think probably Northland School is one of them. They designate 35 minutes a, a day or something for language program, uh, which could be Cree, Diné, it's, it's really wherever you may be living, um, whatever the, the language is. And I'm Cree and uh, also um, Métis from my dad's side. Um, and, but we also have like, like uh, they said, the huge uh, population of, of Diné people as well. But um, language is so important. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the, the whole thing about language. And, and if you um, look at uh, what are the success stories, if, if you're teaching language, uh, or trying to revive the language or trying to, um, you know, uh, have it uh, become a, a living in use again. The, the actual indicator of the success is having the children speak the language and are they. So the reason I mention language is because it's really, it's part of who we are who we are as people. And a lot of our culture, a lot of our knowledge, our traditional indigenous knowledge is also in the language. So I, I feel so, um, uh, um, I guess, ripped off because I was raised without that language, without the beauty and the, the strength of our indigenous knowledge because of what has been done to us to, uh, you know, get rid of the Indian in the child. Uh, and, and that big thing was language, you know, don't, don't let them speak language. We were punished physically, punished, slapped, things stuck in our tongue or, you know, forced to eat soap because we spoke language, our own languages. So that's why I just think it's so important that we hold on to it and make sure that it stays alive. And that the children speak it as well. So that that uh, was another thing that to me, it's not just it's um, it's not just a matter of 
We got to stop the government from flushing the worst toxins in the world down the Athabasca River. It's more than that because it's our whole lives. And so what I feel, and I, I think, I, I, I believe most of you would, would agree with this, that what we need is a real paradigm shift in what is going on with our energy, what is going on with uh, the waste in our, in our daily lives and so on. And to me, it's not just a matter of, um, you know, we do our, our work, our awareness building and all these things, but what's going to happen in the next generation? And to me, that means a, a real paradigm, paradigm shift right there. Um, to bring it back to just the topic of our conversation today, um, I uh, spoke earlier with our science advisor, Paul Belanger, and um, he gave me some numbers. And right now, we are taking 2 million barrels of bitumen a day out of the ground. And this means that we are actually uh, producing 12 million barrels of waste a day of toxic tailings waste. And thank you to Mike for saying lakes. Yeah, they're not just ponds anymore. These are lakes, huge lakes. And I don't know if anybody's ever uh, been in a plane or a helicopter that's that's gone across the, the northeastern part of uh, Alberta and they could see the extent on the ground and it is mind blowing. And, um, and so these are, these are just uh, some of the bigger things to be aware of. And, and what do we do about it? And I don't have the answers. So I actually look to Jesse and Mike and, and Nigel and Air and, and um, uh, Ariel and and all these all these other people because they're working at this stuff day to day, and um, and so anything I could do, you know, to support that work, um, I would do it. Um, we um, we came our organization, like Jesse says, has been small, but we've been growing steadily, and we have amazing, talented, committed people working as keepers nowadays and um, and and the whole partnership is it is happening we are getting bigger and and getting more uh people involved and and our family is getting bigger basically so um i want to add another thing before because it's in my thought and i don't want to forget it um the whole uh, north is the boreal forest here. And uh, boreal forest, like the Amazon, has, is a very, very important sink, uh, carbon sink. It's very important to the whole world. And you know how people say um, the Amazon is the lungs of the earth? Well, I believe it's one of them. And we're the other. We're the other lung in the north. So to me, that's really important. Go, Lula, go. So I don't know if anybody knows what's happening in Brazil, but <laughs> but we're trying to, you know, like like our hearts are right there with those people. We don't want to see the Amazon being burned down and desecrated constantly, like what's going on up here. So I I think we have to to work together, you know, and, um, and I, and, and I am involved in various groups and organizations. And one is a global organization at the moment, based here in the University of Alberta, the Aramat project, uh, and that's concerning uh, biodiversity and the health and well being of indigenous people. And I'm, I'm there as a, I guess you could call me a elder advisor or something. I'm not an expert, but I'll 
definitely give as much advice as I can. So, you know, having come from a background of, of doing a lot of activism work in my young days uh, and, um, and, and, you know, doing what I can now and, and trying to enjoy my life as much as I can, um, I, um, I, I do feel like I do have a perspective on what has happened in the past and, uh, and what we need to do uh, going forward to, to help our world, help our planet. Uh, one of the teachings that I give to the kids too, as we're going out uh, nature walks, you know, and we're by the Hanging Stone River there, just not too far in the middle of Fort McMurray, Alberta. And, uh, and we just listen, right? All, um, make them close their eyes and all they do is just listen. And what they hear is, well, they hear the birds, you know, they hear cars in the distance and they'll hear the running water and and the wind and uh and so one of the things that we talk about is you know when a baby is born a baby is 75 percent water and if you look at the girt the earth the globe 75 percent water so i tell those children you know you are a little earth you are you're 75 percent water when you're born and and just carry on with the with you know giving them the understanding that you are precious you're a precious being and uh and and all that knowledge that comes from your ancestors is going to be there and it's in our whole systems and it's carried in the water so with that um i would like to say thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm really happy to be here. Hi, hi. And uh, I was thank you to the the prayer that we had earlier tonight. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Cleo. She is one of our foundations for Keepers of the Water. Um, so we're gonna open it up for a few questions. We have saved some time for questions. Uh, let's go. Where's the questions? <laughs> we're here to, we're here to answer your questions. Um, and what we've been told is they can treat the tailings apparently, but that it costs a lot of money and the companies don't want to pay a lot of money. So apparently there are options out there, but it's just that the companies, the companies are trying to find the cheapest and fastest way possible to get rid of the tailings. Who's going here? Oh, Brian, are you moderating the questions? Uh, so we just have one question here. Um, is there a safe way to treat the tailings at this point so that they can be released? Okay, so is there a safe way to treat the tailings? I was just talking about that earlier tonight, but yes, there is a safe way to treat the tailings, but it costs money. And, and that's the whole thing here. It, the whole issue right now is that the, um, the companies uh, don't want to, uh, to fork over that amount of money because their bottom line is profits and that's gonna dip into their profits. And and so we get approached by these companies, like these people all the time, they have ways to treat the tailings, but apparently once they go to the corporations, the corporations will take that information and patent it, and then it's no longer that person's information. So it's like a very huge discussion. It's an international discussion. And the one thing that bothers me is it should never fall on the shoulders of the communities that are impacted by it to, to be the ones to solve this issue. So when people come to like Mike Mercury or Cleo Reese and say, well, how do we treat the tailings? That's not for them to figure out. You know, that's for, for you guys to figure out. Yeah, it's only going to cost 5 million bucks for that uh, Dr. Clifford Cardinal's uh... A machine there. He did Saddle Lake. It's eight miles by six miles. It's 40 feet deep. And he did that in six months with his machine. Only five million bucks. 
Yeah, we need to learn more from Tony Steinhauer and Clifford Cardinal. They have a, a way to treat water. And so we need to we need to talk to them because we keep hearing about that. Any other questions? I know there's some online. Is Wendy going to field those or how does that work? We'll try and answer two more questions because we do want to get people out on time. And uh, yeah. so we'll take maybe two online and then the one in person here. Sure. Um, question about UNDRIP. Was Article 46 passed by the UN Assembly? Assembly. I'm alarmed about the impact of this on the right to self-determination, especially for Indigenous peoples. So, Daniel, maybe you can answer that question? Yes, the, that was passed by the, the UN General Assembly, uh, and it was added by states um, uh, after Indigenous people had worked on that declaration. Uh, and and it it weakens the, the declaration, uh, but I think it's important to point out that that UN declaration is is not a document that recognizes indigenous sovereignty. It's a document that recognizes certain rights, uh, but it does that within this paradigm of, of state control and ownership over land. So it's really premised on this idea that yes, nation states own and control the land and make decisions about land use, water use, exploitation of hydrocarbons, minerals, all of that. But then with some kind of checks and balances on that, that indigenous peoples can use and limited uh, governance jurisdictions for indigenous peoples, mostly over local and internal uh, issues. Uh, and then other minimum standards uh, of rights to different things like education, health and wellness and 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 well-being and whatnot. So it's it's not a document that recognizes in indigenous sovereignty. But I also want to point out that 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 UN declaration is supposed to be the floor. It's not like a, a modern treaty that's intended to be a final settlement of rights. Uh, it's supposed to be the floor and indigenous rights can can surpass that but they're not supposed to be less than that. Um, and if the UN declaration is the floor, then I would say that existing section 35 rights in Canadian law is like the basement. It absolutely does not meet that minimum requirement. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, he'll be doing a presentation at the legal summit on December 8th and 9th. If you guys are interested, it's an in-person only event. So check for more information on our website, keepersofthewater.ca. So we'll take one more question from online. And then I think we have one question in person and we ask you all to stay. We are going to do a closing prayer. So for those of you in person and online, please close with us in a good way. All right, so one more question online. Uh, what are Indigenous peoples up north doing to address this issue? How are they coming together? Well, they're here. <laughs> You know, we have a lot of people with keepers of the water that, as Daniel mentioned, the whole Dene National Assembly um, made a unanimous resolution to reject the dumping of the tailings. So that's like all of the Dene communities in in the north have uh, voted on that and passed a resolution. Hello. Um Okay, all right. Um, one of the recent things that the uh, ACFN has completed with the, I think it's within the EIAs, um, they now have to have ACFN at the table for any of the policy or decision makings that go on there. So one of the cases that they went fought against for a very long time was that the nations were at the table when any kind of policy with regards to environment in our region, we, we were there. So they've been recently just won actually that case. It was an actual court case that they succeedingly won and had um, proudly said that uh, they can't do anything now without us being there at the table. So what are we doing? Well, we're matching them. You know, we have the CVM program that matches what uh, the government testing are doing. In fact, even greater. Some of the stuff we found, they haven't found. Um, some of the stuff we started doing, they haven't done. So as has stated, none of this stuff was supposed to be our responsibility. It's not. But we're taking it on and we're doing it. Um, people like myself and Ariel have to do 
um, things on our own um, in order just to make some small differences. And, and those small differences make the biggest impacts, which is why I continue to be part of the grassroots movements and talks. Like I, I know what they can do. I know what they've done in the past and, and I know what we're gonna do in the future. Mike, while you're there, uh, you did mention uh, that uh, there was an offer of $50 million to a community to look after the tailings plant. Who actually had the nerve to offer that? And was the government involved in any way? Suncor. Really? Suncor. And did he, did anyone in in government have knowledge of this offer? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They were they're all like, hey, let's go bug these guys. Okay. Thank you. They, they got together and they said, let's go after the weakest link. So, because the fair states and all said no, and they knew one of the nations were struggling with money. And they're like, hey, we've seen your recent uh, grant request. We need, you need some money, How about $50 million. And we'll drop 10, 20 up front and 30 to maintain the next 20 or 30 years of it, something like that. And they're like, uh, oh, maybe. But then all, all around, they were told not to. So I don't know what, I don't think they, they took it because we haven't heard of any signed ink deals of someone having responsibility of the tailings now. So they got the message. So thank you all again. The next one, the last uh, in-person presentation, this uh, and hybrid is November 16th. So join us in person if you'd like. I think we're going to even bring some door prizes next time and uh, or online. And Cleo was talking about it. Where do we go from here? You know, like what we're doing is not sustainable. And so it's going to be a very interesting conversation on November 16th. So with that, I just thank you all again. Kinana Skompna Wow. And uh, Mio Tipskal, have a good evening. And I'm going to invite Cleo, the elder, um, to come and close us off with a prayer. So have a good evening, everyone. Okay, hey, um, thank you for, for this honor. Yeah, if you could stand, if you want. <laughs> I would like to... Uh, Say a couple words, a little bit of, that I know. No tawi nan, kina nas komit nan anoch kaya sigak sa way yaman. I ask Creator to bless us, to look after us, keep us strong, help us in our daily lives, to look after one another, to look after our lands, to look after all the things that keep us alive so that we will be strong for the future. Give us the strength and the guidance that we need to go ahead and have a better future for our next generations to come. And thank you for all the beautiful gifts that we have been given and help us as we go along in our journeys and help all the people that are suffering and those who have tra to travel, let them go home safely. Hi, hi, thank you. Thank you, everyone.